we are now about to undertake what happens when you take elements and we are going to mix them with fluid and that fluid is going to be water and what are the consequences inside of a human body and why or for that matter any living organism plant slime mold wombat for you guys i'll draw a human here's a human not really correct anatomical position but whatever okay and remember a few minutes ago we said that if you did something like this and you added that to h c o 3 minus it gave you h 2 c o 3 now let's put some names to this stuff well here's a hydrogen ion and here's bicarbonate and this is called carbonic acid, CA. Okay, and what I need you to see here is that what can happen depending upon what's going on inside of the body, things can spontaneously dissociate via chemical reaction and you can change the total concentration of ions inside of the body, okay? And that change can change the acidity and the alkalinity now of what's going on inside of that body. What ends up happening, of course, is that if we have too many of these, the pH of that will change the acidity. And notice in our example here, we don't have any hydrogen, we don't have any hydroxide ions, so we're not worried about the alkalinity. But for right now, this is the example. And you remember, this was a reversible reaction, which means if I change colors here, okay, I can get this arrow to now go up this way and depend on what's going on inside of the body and the activity of some enzyme at this place here we can change the amount of these the amount of carbonic acid inside the body the amount of hydrogen protons and bicarbonate bicarbonate is the naturally occurring buffer that keeps you inside your normal ph range ph range for human beings is 7.45 to 7.35. Okay, when you look down here, the concentration of ions in pure water is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. So that means that the pH of hydrogen protons inside of the body should be somewhere, if it's neutral, at around 7. So that means that you are slightly alkaline. And what do I mean by that? If we have a pH scale, and I'm sure I'll show you one in a couple of minutes, but let's imagine a pH scale goes from 0 to 14. Neutral is 7, and that means everything from 0 to 7 is acidic. So I'm going to put that in blue. I'll put hydrogen protons over here. And then over here, over here, we're going to change the concentration of hydroxide ions. And that's not completely true, but it's true enough for what we need to explain today. Okay, so anytime we actually have high hydroxide ion concentration, it should be alkaline. Anytime we have low or should have high concentrations of hydrogen protons, you should have a more acidic solution. And this is all true. This is what we see inside every single organism and it's what you see inside different regions inside of cells inside of those organisms. So this is, I told you, we'd have this here. And one of the labs you're going to do inside the class is you're going to run around and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to go find some things inside my house and I'm going to try and figure out where they are on this. And it's going to be pretty boring. But the reality is, is here's your bleach that you clean your wipes with inside your house. If you're using um, Clorox, you can see the pH is something around a 13, which means it's highly alkaline. Whereas you look down here, and the food that you've digested right before sitting down to watch this painful video, okay, the pH of the gastric acid inside of your stomach is somewhere around 1, but that 1 isn't destroying you. Which means Mother Nature has to figure out a way to work with some of these different ranges, because when you think about the orange juice you had or the coffee you drank for breakfast this morning, you can see each of these will change the pH 
of the environment that they move into. Okay. Now this is a logarithmic scale, and the moment somebody says the logs, people tend to freak out. And the pH is the negative of the base 10 logarithm for the hydrogen ions, okay, protons. Likewise, you can see that you can move between the different states here, between hydrogen protons and hydroxide ions, to give you the normal. That, and by normal, I mean if they're equal, it should be somewhere around 7, okay? So that's a basic concept of how this works. Okay. Now, this is the example that I was saying for here's hydrogen protons and here's bicarbonate. And remember I said a moment ago, you need this to stay alive. And this is how it's actually used. Whatever you ingest inside of your body will have to be metabolized. And the waste products of metabolism are always water and carbon dioxide. If you don't understand what I'm talking about here, this should help. Everything you ingest should be converted into some form of glucose, H6, 12, O6, and you are an oxygen breather, which means you have to inhale oxygen, which means when we undergo full metabolism, such that you can actually extract energy out of it, you end up H2O plus CO two plus the nucleic acid ATP, which is where you get all of the energy in your life for you to do what you want to do. Yay. Woohoo. Cool. So this is where this example starts. So figure 220 inside your textbook has this hydrogen proton and bicarbonate over here. And the reason why they're starting here is you can see hydrogen proton is on its own, literally, an ion that would bring down the pH. But by having its own buffer in place, bicarb, it offsets the pH. Now, it has to do this because when you change the total amount of metabolism inside of your body, you make different amounts of water and carbon dioxide. And in the presence of an enzyme, that enzyme can facilitate the formation of carbonic acid, and the formation of that carbonic acid can then be spontaneously broken down to give us a buffer to protect us and change the environment from the hydrogen proton concentration inside of the body. Okay. Now, remember I said these are reversible processes, so that means, depending upon what's going on inside of the body, you may actually need to have this move in an opposite direction. And this is exactly what happens inside of some of the cells inside of your body. I would go so far as to say all of your cells, because for you to make ATP, so all cells that have mitochondria, okay, will be making some amount of carbon dioxide and water such that you end up changing the hydrogen proton concentration inside the body. Now that might be above your pay grade today. You may not necessarily understand exactly everything I tried to teach you there. But that's okay. This is a theme we return to again and again and again because metabolism means that we have a series of chemical reactions to maintain the viability of the organism itself. Okay. Now, when we actually start thinking about how this all happens, carbon becomes, when we start reducing down um, what's the central element. The central element turns out to be carbon. Okay? And you should be able to explain why carbon is important and describe the functional groups that actually attach to it. But we're just going to go through this sort of rapidly because you're going to practice doing this. Carbon has a unique form. It forms the backbone for essentially all of the major macromolecules. I say all the macromolecules with the exception of water, right? But um, because the macromolecule would suggest it's doing something other than water acting as a solvent. Um, it has four electrons, and because of that, and its size, I mean, it's just the appropriate desired size that will allow it to fulfill the octet rule, meaning it needs to interact with multiple things, multiple other elements, so it can fulfill that outer valence shell. Okay, so if I was to draw it for you, let's slow this down here a little bit, but whatever. Okay, draw that for you. Let's go here go there. Here's carbon. Inner ring is full. That means it has 
let's go outside here, outer ring, it means it needs four, one, two, three, four, because there are four that are there, and that allows it now to interact with many, many other different types of elements. And what's important to remember here is if you like playing with Legos, you can figure all of this out because Legos come in different sizes, but to hold everything together, the central element required for life turns out to be carbon. Now there are different types of carbons. The first are hydrocarbons, those are just carbon and hydrogen. So it, and they change the ratio and the number of carbons to hydrogens. And what they're doing is they're storing energy between the bonds. Okay, so the more intricate the bond, the higher the bond number, the more intricate the bonding, the more energy that's stored inside of them. And therefore, when you think about, say, methane gas versus, say, the liquid gases that are used to power your car, you can see that that gasoline used to power your car would have more energy that could be transformed so you can actually have your car move. You wouldn't use that same amount of energy when you're trying to heat your home, though. Okay. Now it's fulfilling the octet rule. Here they've given you methane. I don't really care if you remember that they're 109.5 degrees apart. It's this orientation that allows it to satisfy the octet rule, number one. But number two, it also allows for its stability and its volatility as a gas. Okay. And you can see here, these are aliphatic hydrocarbons of which you can see methane, ethane, and ethane. And the difference is the bonding arrangements, and each of these will store different amounts of energy inside of those spaces. When we think about aromatic hydrocarbons, cyclopentane, cyclohexane, benzene, and pyridine, you're going to see that, especially benzene, when, you, if, when and if you ever get to, say, an organic chemistry class, you use this as the basic building block to build more complex aromatic hydrocarbons. You can see here, okay, it's found in some amino acids, cholesterols, and derivatives. So whatever is happening in the increasing complexity of the aromatic hydrocarbons, we can still use those hydrocarbons to create structural reactants for life. Now, when we think about the chemical descriptions of, of molecules that can be made, and those molecules are hydrocarbons in this case, we can think of them in terms of their isomer formation. And this is all pretty much definitional materials, right? And unfortunately, there's no easy way to teach this stuff. It takes a little bit of creativity on your part to understand that structural isomers have a covalent arrangement of atoms. So you count the number of carbons here, one, two, three, four. For butane, look at isobutane, one, two, three, and four. And what's happened here is we've dropped a methyl group off of that central carbon. Whereas in butane, we didn't do this. Okay, That's what we mean by structural isomers. Count the number of carbons, count the number of hydrogens. They should be the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, it's just the arrangement that's different. Geometric isomers between cis and trans, these refer to the different arrangements of atoms around a double bond. And the tricky part here is remembering that this is a double bond here. And believe it or not, Mother Nature can see the difference between geometric isomers and these things that are called enantiomers. Enantiomers are literally molecules that share chemical formula and bonds, but they differ in the 3D placement of the atoms. And take a look at this. Here's our central carbon. You're going to notice what's different here is it looks like the placement is a mirror image of, but that means the L isomer and the dextrous, okay, the D isomer here, these would bind to different locations and enter into different chemical reactions as a result of the spatial orientations. That's for both geometric isomers and antimers as well, by the way. It's actually really kind of cool. What we're demonstrating is Mother Nature can assemble these things, but the possible shapes determine which chemical reactions will go forward or not. 
And in these cis and trans molecules here, you can see trans configuration of carbon is the opposite side of the double bond. Okay, and the cis configuration is the same side. So here's a lactic acid and oleic, oleic acid, right? And the difference, of course, is you can see how it changes the conformation, the actual shape of the molecule itself. Um, there's no way to superimpose enantiomers. And although, you know, I feel like I'm wasting time talking about this, when we think about what competitive inhibition is going to be in chemical reactions in a couple of days, you need to understand that Mother Nature should be able to tell the difference between a D-alanine and an L-alanine. -al There's no way to twist these models around one another so that they are similar. You cannot superimpose them onto one another's structures. So how does Mother Nature use this then? Well, she uses it by creating these things that are called functional groups. And remember a moment ago, I said, if you can understand how Legos work, you're going to understand how this works. Well, functional groups are repeated hydroxyl, methyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, phosphate, sulfhydryl structures, where if a hydroxyl group is an oxygen that's attached to a hydrogen, and it has a polar property, meaning it now is charged and it will try to interact with something that's charged, right? Likewise, methyl groups are a methyl group that's nonpolar, a carbonyl group as a central carbon, a double bond to oxygen. And you're going to see that each of these, the R is what we're attaching to, okay? Each of these is going to have its own unique chemistry. And by that, I mean the electrons that are flying around this hydrogen and this oxygen are going to cause things to interact differently when it attaches to that R. You should make yourself some, either a table, copy this ta table. You should be able to see that it, when we start building macromolecules, we come back to this table all the time and go, oh, I know, I need to build a fill in the blank, which means I'm going to need some methyl groups. I'm going to need some phosphate groups. I'm going to need some carbonyl groups. And I'm going to assemble it. And it's going to look like fill in the blank with prime. Okay. It's important to un understand what Mother Nature is doing here. And when you break them down to how they all behave when they're alongside each other, you can begin to understand how it is the outcome of chemical reactions can be predicted by the behavior of the functional groups. Okay, so the last set of bonds here are going to be between hydrogen bonds. And this is kind of a really difficult picture to throw at somebody who may or may not have ever seen this before. What you're looking at here is how it is you actually can create two strands of DNA and a DNA backbone is sugar phosphate backbone attaches to nucleotides and the nucleotides are attached via hydrogen bonding. So if here's alanine and here's an adenine, no, it's adenine, adenine, sorry about that. What you can see is they're being held together. Now, A's bind to T's, T's bind to A's. So that means that if here's your adenine and here's your cysteine, there's something hinky. A's bind to T's, T's bind to A's. Unless, of course, we're talking about RNA, and I don't think that's what they're doing here. G's bind to C's. So there's either a typo here, or I need to go look up the structure. DNA backbone, sugar phosphate, adenine does not bind to C. Okay, so we're going to look this up. I'm going to put a big question mark next to this, and hopefully I'll address it by the time we actually cover that inside the class. Maybe I'll find out if somebody asks me about it. I'll know you guys are at least listening to this. Okay. So that's the end of this chapter, and it's perfect, almost perfect timing. Um, what I want you to do is, is to start seeing that the complexity building around carbon is getting fairly intricate. And this is how we actually store information inside of the body. If this is your DNA, even if this is incorrectly assembled, it's going to be interesting for us to understand how Mother Nature takes this as stored information to create, oh, I don't know, let's put, we had a toad at the beginning, right? Let's put a toad back together again with toad face and then you're old. It's not gonna look like a toad. It's gonna look more like a rat or something. So let's put rat legs, there we go the tail on you. Okay, how do you actually get from that information there? 
for living organisms here. Yeah.